So welcome everyone on behalf of UCLA Anderson and our co-sponsors of today's event. This is truly interdisciplinary. We have here as our co-sponsors and the deans are here, the UCLA Henry Samuelli School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, D Dean Vijay Deer, the UCLA School of Law, UCLA School of Public Affairs, Dean Barbara Nelson, and the UCLA Institute of the Environment. Uh, and thanks to each of you for being here to learn more about renewable energy and to understand how a 105-year-old company becomes an industry giant and remains an industry giant for that period of time, though perhaps not exactly in the same industry. How does a corporation evolve and embrace continual change? It's a privilege for me to introduce our distinguished speaker, Patricia Wirtz. I met Pat a few years ago at a woman's power networking conference, and she was kind enough to accept my invitation when I was dean of Penn State School of Business to join our board there. She's not only a good friend of mine, but I consider her to be one of the true luminaries among corporate leaders in America, and hers is a very distinctively global vision. The path of her career has been one of enormously broad and rich experiences. After graduating from Penn State, she began her career as an accountant, she's a CPA, uh, with Ernest & Young, and she worked with a lot of different clients, including the Gulf Oil Corporation. Once they saw how great she was, they were smart, smart enough to hire her away from, Gulf, from e &Y, and at Gulf Oil assigned her to a variety of executive positions in refining, marketing, strategic planning, and finance. Following the merger of Gulf and Chevron in 1987, she was one of the few executives asked to take a leadership role of this combined company running a, an international operation and a global workforce. She managed Chevron's oil fields in Kazakhstan. She negotiated energy deals in Russia, in Russian. She actually speaks Russian. She became president of Chevron Canada and later Chevron International Oil Company. Then with the merger of Chevron and Texaco in 2001, Pat was named executive vice president in charge of the company's refining, marketing, lubricant, and supply and trading operations, otherwise in the lingo of energy companies known as downstream operations. With her international reputation as a business leader, Pat was on the short list for every major CEO position in America, especially in the manufacturing sector, and she finally accepted in May of 2006 ADM's invitation to become its CEO, and in February of 2007 she added the title of Chairwoman of uh, Archer Daniels Midland. In so doing, she became one of only 10 women to lead a Fortune 100 company, uh, Fortune 500 company, excuse me, it is a Fortune 100 company, and it placed ADM as the largest publicly traded company headed by a woman. Also in 2006, Fortune magazine identified her as one of the 25 most influential leaders of the year for her position as CEO and chairman of the world's largest producer of ethanol. She heads the world's largest food processing company, which, by the way, happens to be also the largest producer of biofuels, food and energy, an interesting and very exciting combination. The demand for both food and energy continues to escalate, and we can expect with certainty that given the world's continuing hunger for food and fuel, that there will be severe shortages in each for the foreseeable future. Some have pitted both products against each other, that they are in conflict, that more biofuels necessarily equals less food. Pat is leading a corporation that believes it can achieve both goals, food and fuel, in harmony. To put this in context, of the world's six billion people, a third enjoy the kind of energy on demand that Americans take for granted, like electricity at the flick of a switch. Another third have such energy services intermittently. The final third, which constitutes two billion people, lack access to any kind of energy supply. 
no electricity, no fuel powered cars, or no fuel powered agricultural machinery. Because of this, energy deprived countries are the world's most undernourished, most uneducated, and most impoverished societies, living on less than $2 a day. And their ranks will grow. According to UN estimates, the 50 poorest nations will triple in size over the next 50 years. So getting energy supply, and that includes new form of energy, like biofuels, to the world's poorest nations would transform them from food to education to economic development. New products and technologies that reduce our dependence on oil, improve economic growth, and mitigate climate change are attracting a lot of money. Uh, today's Wall Street Journal reports on the price of farm acreage in the Midwest. Those of you who are real estate investors, I, I suggest you check this out. In Illinois, which is ADM's home state, the price of a, coin, a corn and soybean acre is close to $5,300, up almost 40% since just last year. These opportunities have also been noticed by capital markets. A Monday article in the New York Times tracks the flood of venture capital into clean initiatives and biofuels. European and North American venture capital flowing into clean energy catapulted to $2.6 billion in 2006, nearly double that invested in 2005, and nearly triple that invested in 2004. A good example is our own Board of Visitor member, Betsy Knapp, here today, whose VC investments include Cryo Biofuels, which, was, which has invested more than $25 million in developing alternative, alternative energy processing. So ADM is already the leading global producer of ethanol, and sky-high gasoline prices are making alternatives to a variety of fossil fuels more attractive by the day. ADM used to call itself supermarket to the world, and now, as it becomes an energy giant, it's reshaping itself. To tell us about ADM's own transformation and how it is reshaping the world by leading the biofuels revolution, please join me in welcoming Patricia Woods. Well, thank you, Dean Olin, for uh, that very kind introduction. I am very delighted to be here today. I have uh, tremendous respect for this university and as both a renowned research center as well as uh, an intellectual forming ground for future leaders. I also have great respect and admiration for the Anderson School and certainly for Dean Olin. And as uh, Judy said, we got to know each other uh, a little better through our work on the Board of Visitors at uh, Penn State. And I was particularly impressed and am continued to be impressed with Judy's ability to blend sort of the theoretical insight with uh, truly pragmatic action. I think she embodies uh, the qualities I admire most in leaders, intelligence, passion, commitment to energy, integrity, and, and deeply held values. I truly congratulate you for selecting her as your dean, and I foresee great things in your future. Judy, thank you for being here. One of the values that I do share with Judy, and I'm sure all of you, is a commitment to education and indeed lifelong learning. Uh, it's something that my parents instilled in me, and I've hopefully passed it on to my children as well. In fact, uh, my mother, during our summer vacations, or what uh, I thought were summer vacations, she thought was for learning. And while other people were maybe at the beach or somewhere else, my mother took my brother and I on visits to local businesses maybe not even so local. I went to the Heinz Pickle Factory, uh, the U.S. Steel Mill. I went to Gulf Oil's Research Center. I think I was 11 at that time. Uh, Pittsburgh Plate Glass Factory. And I've been asked sometimes whether these trips sowed the seeds of interest in, uh, in business, and I'm not sure that's the case. I'm not sure my mother thought she was grooming a future business leader by taking uh, me to see how pickles were made. But as a librarian herself, and I guess a bit of an educator herself, she believed in using your time and the world around you for learning and to keep learning. And I agree. Uh, that's one of the reasons I was pleased not only to be here today, but I spent some time in, in UCLA's classrooms yesterday 
uh, with some faculty and certainly enjoy spending time with students. I would like to learn your perspectives and uh, your perspectives on the business world and some issues today. What do you see as some of the opportunities? What issues do you care about? Um, I'm planning to have plenty of time for Q&A afterwards, so I hope that um, uh, you ask lots of questions and I may even ask uh, you a few questions. Okay, this afternoon I would like to discuss leading the energy evolution and particularly the role of renewable, sustainable biofuels in our energy's future. Uh, my company, ADM, is uh, the global leader of biofuel production, as Judy said. And since this topic is so much in the news today and has such public and political interest, I thought you might be interested in a perspective uh, from ADM, our perspective on biofuels and what the future might hold there. I also know that some of you might be interested in the issues around leading a large business, a large global business particularly, and one that's undergoing change. So I think afterwards, Judy and I might have some discussion on this change management uh, process following my comments. So I'll be happy to answer your questions on any of those subjects, either the energy evolution or change management or even general issues as well. I usually get a few questions on uh, career paths, so if you want to save those for later too, I'm, I'm, uh, I'll be happy to answer those. So I'm going to start by giving you a snapshot of my company and to provide some context on our role in the energy evolution. I'll step back a bit then and give you a quick history of biofuels in the US. And I'll talk about the global trends that are influencing the growth of biofuels today. I will also outline some steps that I think are critical to the future of this very important and I think very exciting space. So let me give you a snapshot of my company, the Archer Daniels Midland Company, ADM has been a premier agribusiness for over 100 years. Uh, people generally know us as a producer of food ingredients, but we actually started the company. The company began producing industrial solvents from uh, crushed linseed. Uh, today, we take a large volume of agricultural crops, corn, wheat, soybeans, canola, cocoa, and we trade them, we transport them, we store them, and we process them into all kinds of end products food ingredient products, feed for animals, industrial products. And we distribute these end products to customers, primarily large food and energy companies throughout the world. We're a Fortune 60 company. We have over 25,000 employees around the world, operating in about 60 countries, and we have revenue exceeding uh, 40 billion. We are the global leader today in biofuels. And for those who may be unfamiliar, maybe even with the term biofuels, it generally refers to transportation fuels that are made from agricultural crops rather than the fuels made traditionally from crude oil. Uh, we are the largest producer of ethanol here in the US and we've been in that business and an ethanol leader since we started uh, back in 1978. We're also the largest producer of biofuels in Europe. Uh, it is the, big, the largest market in the world for biodiesel and we entered the biodiesel business in 1995 and in about 11, 11 and a half years. Uh, we're the largest corn processor in the world, about two and a half million bushels. I have to remember to say bushels and not barrels. Two and a half million bushels uh, per day. And we make over 24 products from just a single kernel of corn. We can talk about that a little bit more uh, later. We are the premier um, processor of oil seeds, so canola, rapeseed. Uh, and the refiner and packager of vegetable oils. We grind about 15% of the world's cocoa, and we uh, form industrial and confectionery products from, uh, for chocolate uses. And then we have this very large network, hundreds, thousands of trucks, rail cars, barges, ships, and we are able to take grains or crops from essentially anywhere where they are produced and process them on a diverse scale and slate of products and move these products to any of the destination markets as well in the world. So that's kind of a quick snapshot of our company today. I hope it illustrates for you sort of the size and scope and both our leadership position in both biofuels and the agricultural processing value chain, so to speak. And that large global position in both food and fuel, I think gives us a very unique position and perspective on this whole energy evolution. 
So now, as I said, I want to step back a little bit and give you a, um, a little bit of history on renewable fuels. And it's a history that I think is a little important because it points to some of the challenges, even some of the challenges that Judy spoke about, and the opportunities, perhaps even some of the misconceptions uh, or new data that's available, yet we still read about other things today. For instance, you may be surprised to learn that renewable fuels, sustainable fuels, are far from a new idea. Uh, the development of biofuels goes back to the early, early 19th century. Uh, Samuel Morley developed the first engine to run on ethanol and turpentine. Uh, by the late part of that century, Rudolf Diesel had developed the first engine to run on peanut oil, also a biofuel. Uh, and Henry Ford, when he built his first engine, it was the quadricycle, it was truly um, a, an ethanol um, engine. It ran on pure ethanol. And then later in time, when crude oil, uh, it's interesting to note, like traditional crude oil, petroleum crude oil, it was available, but it was not very plentiful at that time. And it was not distilled into gasoline, but instead it was distilled into kerosene for lighting and heating uh, and, and some cooking. So by the time the 20th century came around, at the start of the 20th century, actually biofuels and fossil fuels shared the transportation fuel market about equally. Of course, it wasn't a very big market, but shared it rather equally. In fact, the car that Henry Ford launched, the, uh, the sort of the automotive revolution, the Model T, it actually was a flexible fuel vehicle. It could run on gasoline or ethanol or a combination of both. And Ford envisioned something. In fact, I brought a quote today. He envisioned a future of biofuels. He said, and uh, I think quite famously, uh, we can, and this is a quote, we can get fuel from fruit from the sumac by the roadside, from apples, weeds, sawdust, almost anything that can be fermented. It remains for someone to find out how this fuel can be produced commercially." End quote. Well, many someones actually went on to commercialize ethanol. Uh, during World War I, demand for ethanol reached 60 million gallons uh, per year. And during World War II, ethanol was also used in a variety of non-transportation uh, wartime uses. But after the war, ethanol essentially disappeared. From the late 40s to uh, even the late 70s, actually, when we started making it, there was virtually no commercial ethanol produced or available in the United States. So what happened? Why in the world are we today discussing the need for alternative fuels the need for biofuels rather than celebrating a half a century of innovation that has unlocked the potential of nature to produce both food and fuel? Well, the answer is that just prior to World War II, oil was discovered in the Middle East. And after the war, the world had all the inexpensive oil it needed and biofuels simply could not compete. Now today, some people still question whether biofuels will be able to compete, particularly if we see a significant drop in world crude oil prices. And I think the answer is yes, they can. And the reason I believe they can is because the world has changed. Uh, today, there is an array of economic, political, environmental, uh, resource-related factors that point to a fundamentally different reality today for biofuels. And I think that reality starts with the fact that while demand for energy is growing, the world is no longer awash in easy, inexpensive crude oil. In fact, we are actually consuming as a, as a world population oil faster than we are finding it. And many established oil and gas fields outside of OPEC are either maturing or they're on, on decline. And new resources, as you read and probably know, are very difficult to access. They're sometimes in areas like the Arctic or very deep water, places that are technologically challenged, and others in our, are in some of the most socially complex and politically perhaps unstable places in the world. Venezuela, Indonesia, Russia, Nigeria, the Middle East. And we also face restrained refining capacity. As an example, to meet the projected global demand for fuel through 2015, this is just eight years from now, so today to 2015, the world would need to add a capacity of nine and a half million barrels a day. Now, to give you a picture of just how much capacity that is, traditional refining capacity, that would be like adding four new refineries a year, as big as some of the refineries here in Los Angeles, biggest ones in the world, every year for the next eight years. 
and you know this country has had, hasn't built a new refinery in 30 years, while there are some new ones being announced outside the U.S., it's a, it's a difficult demand to meet. So all of these factors taken together lead many analysts, including the Department of Energy. And the Department of Energy projects that by the middle of the century, energy from traditional sources will be insufficient to meet the projected global demand. And traditional refining capacity, they go on to say, in both the U.S. and outside the U.S., will be insufficient to meet motor fuel demand. So clearly there will be a gap from traditional supply and the growing demand. And today there's also an increasing desire to see biofuels help fill this gap, and indeed to even do more. Because at the same time as we need see the need for more energy, there's also a growing desire for energy security or for environmental improvement for a stronger, more economically viable rural community. So biofuel, biofuels fits this bill. These fuels are good for people. They add to the fuel supply. They're good for the environment, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and providing a positive energy balance. They're good for agriculture as they uh, create greater demand for crops and increase uh, farming income. And they're good for energy security, providing a piece of renewable, sustainable, grown at home energy. So today we see the benefits of biofuels are more recognized and more appreciated than ever before. And indeed, as I track some of the public and, and press information, uh, industry and government discussion on energy, I believe we have moved beyond the question of whether or not renewable fuels will play a role in our future. Really the questions today are more how big can the renewable fuels become and how fast can we get there and what might it take? So to address these questions, let me start with where we are today. Around the world, there are two main forms of biofuel, ethanol and biodiesel. And ethanol in this country is made from corn. In Brazil, it is made from sugar. Uh, biodiesel is mostly made from vegetable oil. It's primarily sold in Europe. And there is a very well-developed growing market there. In this country, biodiesel is a much more of a startup or, or smaller mode. And I'll give a bit more detail on the corn-based ethanol because I think it is in the United States sort of the here and now solution, here and now biofuel. Uh, today, the U.S. capacity, the U.S. produces ethanol at 5.8 billion gallons annually. Um, it surpasses what's currently the renewable fuel standard. And most ethanol is actually blended into the current nation's motor gasoline fuel supply. And all cars and trucks today are warranted to run up to a 10% or are warranted to up to a 10% ethanol fuel blend. And we believe ethanol can grow up to that full 10% blend. That would take it to about 14 billion gallons. And we think we can do that with the current corn today primarily as the feedstock. Need some advances in seed technology, which is coming. We'll see greater yields in, in corn acreage and maybe even some additional acreage. And we also recognize that many may want that biofuels to grow well beyond that 14 billion gallons. In fact, President Bush's recent call, he said 20 in 10. That meant 20% of the fuel supply in 10 years would be biofuels. Or another way to look at it, 35 billion gallons of renewable fuel by 2017. There are other proposals in Congress. They call for even greater production. And they're very visionary proposals. They foresee a future well beyond what corn ethanol can do alone. And in this future, new feedstocks, new production methods, and new products will probably all play a role. And we actually share this vision. We know that the future of energy is not in a single feedstock or even a single product, but it is in the diversity of supply and in conservation. So to meet visionary numbers such as some of these, we believe that bioenergy must progress along three critical paths, innovation, investment, and partnership. Uh, we will need innovation. We will need to make croplands and crops more productive and to develop new and better feedstocks, sometimes what's known as cellulosic or the non-food feedstocks like corn stover or wood chips or switchgrass or some waste or biomass waste products. We will need innovation to improve current processes themselves and create new processes that can boost yield, lower costs, lower energy uses. Uh, we will need innovation in the actual products. 
And at ADM, we are employing innovation in all of these areas. We are working ourselves at the moment to develop some cellulosic ethanol by focusing first on the things, the materials that we already handle today or we already collect at our plants or potentially could collect. Our processes involve thermochemically treating corn hulls to allow some of their fiber, part of their fiber, to be additionally fermented into alcohol. And we believe this process can add 15% additional ethanol production without adding a single ear of corn. So cellulosic applications like this we think exist today, or at least in the laboratory, and they can be commercially producible as little as two years away. Now other technologies involving much more complex things and different feedstocks and different uh, cellulosic uh, technologies that you might read about, we think they would arrive in more like the five to seven, maybe even 10 year time frame. Investment is the second critical path. Uh, we will need to see more investment, a lot more investment in research, uh, both to accelerate the deployment of the here and now biofuels and also to speed the arrival of the next generation breakthroughs. We will need to see investment in infrastructure, very important, the capability or the capacity to collect and store what might be new materials, different materials, or large amounts of biomass. Investment in larger transportation systems capable of potentially handling this material in these complex requirements. Uh, ADM is making investments in this area. We're investing about two and a half billion, a little over two and a half billion in new facilities. Uh, some of them are new plants, two new ethanol plants here in the U.S. to increase our, our capabilities, two new biodiesel plants uh, in, here in the U.S. and one in Brazil. In additional rail cars and infrastructure, our transportation network, which is already the largest in the world, in the next generation and in the next generation of technology. Partnership is the third critical path that I think is important for our industry, both up and down the supply chain. Perhaps some partnerships we haven't forged before, some that we have with farmers, with engine manufacturers, with government, with customers, with environmentalists, and with all who have a stake in this energy future. I think the growth of bioenergy presents a, an extremely rare opportunity to build new value for each of these stakeholders. Perhaps after understanding what is possible together, we can build more value than any of us could actually build alone. Now this path forward, which we see as a full of promise and full of opportunity, is not without its challenges or even its questions. Um, if you follow the media, and, and Judy quoted a couple of um, ideas of discussion regarding biofuels or even renewable energy, you'll note that there are questions raised about agriculture's ability, agriculture's ability to provide for both fuel and our food needs, particularly in the long term. So let me speak to this issue for, for just a minute. The fact that the world is going to need more fuel and more food, I thought I'd give a little bit of detail around the, uh, the food trend since I've already talked about the fuel trend. Global demand for food is also expected to rise. And if you think about that middle of the century, while the population is expected to grow by 50% by the middle of the century, demand for food will double. It will double because as rising incomes, particularly in developing countries, it allows for more protein in the diet and more intensive diets. And so we need to look, some look at the need for more food and more fuel, and they suggest that there is a conflict between these needs, a fight, if you will, between food and fuel. And some suggest that taking a hierarchical approach, putting one above the other, taking a hierarchical approach and hierarchical thinking is the way to solve this problem. I tend to believe that hierarchical thinking will always relegate something, some of those needs, some of those human needs to the bottom of the list. And where on a list, where on a list of food and fuel would you put the need for security, the need for a clean environment? Where would you put the need for a robust agricultural sector? You know, we believe that a more holistic approach is more fruitful. And we also understand that food and heat and light and mobility and security and a healthy environment are all fundamental human needs. And we believe that the best solutions will come by looking at this more holistically and recognizing the interconnection between them. 
And while it's perhaps easier to see here in the U.S. a case for a more holistic view of human needs, I would suggest that such a view is also vital to the developing world. You know, in the developing world as well, energy is fundamental to economic progress and the alleviation of poverty, which is at the root of hunger. And it's a key to an improved standard of living. You know, over the course of, of my career, I, my work has taken me to some of the most challenging places in the world. And I have met people, I've met mothers who had sufficient food to feed their family, but they lacked the mobility to take their child to the health clinic when they were sick. I've also seen school children who fill the aisles of a tiny little convenience store market each night because it was powered by its own generator and it was the only place on the island that had reliable energy and lights by which to study. So as we explore the opportunities and responsibilities that this energy evolution, I believe we are best served by taking the broadest, most holistic view possible. Indeed, as we look at the long-range development of the biofuels industry, not just today, but the long-range, we believe that the advances that it will require, advances in technology, development of seeds that are more drought-resistant, more pest-resistant, greater yields in the crop, more efficient farming practices, all these advances hold the potential. They hold the potential for more food and more fuel throughout the world and actually at potentially better prices for consumers. So that's a look at the sort of evolutionary path of bioenergy from, uh, if you will, its history to what I think is its future. And I hope that my comments this afternoon, uh, perhaps some of you have glimpsed a future that you feel as excited about as I do. Uh, a future where exciting innovations uh, will create the possibilities to feed and fuel the world. You know, I'd like to speak to many of the students, to the students actually in the audience today, uh, before we begin our, our Q&A, because as we talk about the future of bioenergy, it is truly your future we're talking about. To fulfill the promise of bioenergy, we will need to enlist the brightest minds of your generation. And we know that to win your commitment, to actually deserve your finest efforts, you need to be able to not only see the opportunities, but feel them and believe it. We must paint a picture for you, a picture of the future that is credible. We must address our challenges and our critics, but we must not let our cynics obscure the vision or even dim the passion that so many people feel that is a better way to a better future coming into view. I'd like to say to you, if you feel as excited about this future, don't wait. You know, I keep hearing that song, um, John Mayer song, Waiting on the World to Change on the radio. And when I hear it, I think, oh, please don't accept that as your generational anthem. It's a lovely song. It's very mellow. Our generation is sort of James Taylor-like. But don't approach that. Don't adopt that as your approach to life, to your future. It is all wrong. Don't wait on the world to change. Step up and be a leader and change it. You have an extraordinary opportunity, perhaps not a once-in-a-lifetime, but a once-in-a-generation opportunity to be part of the solution to some of the world's most pressing needs. So I encourage you to be leaders. Yours is a future well worth leading. Thank you. Thank you, Pat, for a very, very um, interesting historical and current view of uh, fossil and, and um, renewable fuels. And I'm going to take Michael here as friend and host and ask a few, a couple of initial questions to start the Q&A going and then we'll open it up to the audience. I'll be briefing my questions and I know um, I can count on Pat to be briefing her answers. So the first question that I think is often on people's mind when they talk about uh, biofuels and renewable energy is could, could you speak to the research on the advantages of ethanol and other biofuels for the environment? Because there are some that dispute the claims that it is so much superior to fossil fuels, or at least claim that the advantages are more modest than what is. Sure, sure. Um, it, there are, is some old research that oftentimes is quoted that it's not a ethanol now, is not a product that is energy positive that by the time you grow all the corn and use the machinery to grow the corn, process the corn into ethanol, 
that you have um, not a positive energy balance or even a um, greenhouse gas emission um, savings. And um, in fact, most of the current research uh, not only refutes that, but it's a lot more data driven. Um, the Department of Energy has some on its website that's very helpful. Um, so does the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, a lot of university studies, and it's about 35% positive energy balance. 30 to 35% are some of the averages of late. And uh, of course, because it's a renewable fuel where you're taking the solar energy and you know, putting it through the plants and processing, and um, it has a positive uh, effect as far as CO2 emissions as well. Okay, another question, and this may reflect my ignorance, because there are so many cars on the road today that are supposedly equipped to uh, tank up on ethanol blends, but uh, the, the conception is that you can't pull up to a pump because the, the infrastructure for distribution isn't as advanced as the cars are. Help us with that. Sure. I, I talked about a 10% ethanol blend. You should feel good that when you fill up with your car that you have probably in, in LA Basin here where there's probably a 5.8 to 6% ethanol blend in the fuel. Um, in many places in the country it's up to that full 10%. That's actually the more natural growth path for ethanol for now as opposed to E85. Uh, E85 will grow and I think will grow in, in small ways regionally where there's a demand for it, where there's um, infrastructure to provide it. But that is additional transportation, it's additional tankage, it's additional pumps. There's a lot of expense to create a separate E85 process when there's this natural growth of blended ethanol. So I think you can expect to see more and more ethanol blended into the fuels throughout this country up to that full 10%. And maybe if auto manufacturers continue to look at their research, it may even be able to go to 15 or 20%. So again, a more natural, almost invisible thing to the consumer to be able to use um, um, blended Gasoline. In your um, global uh, meetings and taking the 30,000 foot level, you know the geopolitics of oil, of uh, fossil fuels are with us virtually every day, whether it's corporate balance sheets or civil wars or, or global wars or, or frankly the health of families and, and the, the wealth of families. What are at the 30,000 foot level from a global geopolitical standpoint, the issues that you are challenged with uh, in talking about renewable energy or um, biofuels? Sure. Um, you know, geopolitical issues, of course, are often around trade issues. And I would say in, um, in the agriculture business, as well as the, the processing and moving of agricultural processes, of agricultural products, um, Trade and trade balances and trade issues, Doha round, et cetera, are pretty big discussion points. And uh, while uh, our country and maybe even our company believe in tra free trade, having said that, trade is often not always free. And um, sometimes there are barriers, sometimes there are benefits. And so that's one of the discussions that's uh, pretty prevalent. The second is around uh, um, agricultural um, lands and their uses and the environmental protection associated with that. For example, in this country, we have a, um, a conservation um, process that allows a set aside of lands. And uh, there's discussion today in this country and elsewhere. Should we take those lands and make them more agriculturally um, productive? And probably the answer lies a little bit into both, that you can still protect the environment and maybe take a small piece of it because of the new, again, agronomic processes around the edges of farms and be able to make them more productive. So those two are probably the um, two most common discussions. And my last question before I open it up, and I, I suppose I can't resist this. Um, we're heading into a political election here. Do you think that the debate over energy, climate change, the environment will be a factor in the political election? And I could shorten this question as, uh, do you think Al Gore will run for president? <laughs> Okay, I won't answer the last one. <laughs> I don't know is the answer to the last one. Um, I certainly think that energy, it, it's great that this country is talking about energy and a comprehensive energy pro, uh, policy. And it's great that people are talking about uh, energy in terms of environment, security, um, even price, uh, and diversification of supply. And, and actually, renewable fuels, interestingly, are an issue. What other issue can you think of that almost both sides of the aisle support in some way, shape, or form, or all political and presidential candidates are talking about as an opportunity 
to swell the um, the energy pool, so to speak, uh, with grown at home energy. So I think it not only will be a discussion. I'll see. I think you'll see more advances in some of the opportunities for growth. One of the things I think we need to worry about a little bit is out of control growth or not keeping up supply and demand. So sometimes you have very visionary goals out there, which are great, but in order to get there, you may want to phase them in what we might call rational growth um, over a rational period of time as opposed to uh, uh, trying to get so out of balance with supply and demand because we kind of have unintended consequences when, when that happens. So you're not declaring which presidential candidate you'll be advising? I am not. <laughs> All right. So let's All of them and any of them that want to ask us questions. Okay. Let's open it up for questions. And do you mind just telling us who you are, David? So I'm David Weibel, I'm a employee of Chico? Is it on? So energy perspective, do you see that there's going to be any change uh, from the auto manufacturer's perspective as far as what we're going to do? Great. Um, David asked two questions there, if I understood correctly. One is around... Uh, uh, efficiency of ethanol and what about a product called biobutanol and secondly what about flex fuel vehicles and how will auto manufacturers kind of step up to the plate particularly for smaller vehicles did I get that right um, certainly first of all on the 10% blended ethanol which again I think is somewhat of the max we can get to with today's um, um, corn as well as uh, what vehicle manufacturers warrant you will see an indescribable and undetectable change in any fuel um, efficiency um, at the 10% blend. The more you would move to a more E85 or even E100, you'll see some, um, some, some changes. Uh, Biobutanol is an interesting product, and in fact, due to its density and, um, and, and issue, I think it's a very interesting um, product. What is, um, what is sometimes not clear is how you get there from here, and it's in the processing. Um, Biobutanol from fermentation of um, of, a, of a cellulosic material like strawgrass or something is, is right now estimated to be something like four times the cost of, of ethanol produced from corn as an example. And so there would be a lot of changes needed to take place between now and then. And sometimes when you think of the new technologies that need to have research, it's not just one, one product like, or one uh, feedstock like sawgrass one type of technology in the middle like a fermentation that we know today with enzymes that we know today and one product out the other end. It's probably going to be a whole combination of um, feedstocks, processes in the middle that might steal from other technologies like acidification or pyrolysis or uh, different types of conversion, be they thermochemical, whether they be enzymatic, uh, and products out the other end that again may be manufacturers of engines can help say a mixed alcohol might even be better than a biobutanol or an ethanol today. So I think the, the tr transition from today where we are to sometime in the future, a lot of these possibilities will be very exciting. Um, to answer your question about flex fuel vehicles, I can't actually speak for the manufacturers, but a few that I have talked with, including um, Rick Wagner at General Motors, they will see and, and predict a lot more flex fuel vehicles, and Ford actually in Brazil, um, a lot more flex fuel vehicles of all types, not only the larger ones, but um, their smaller engines. In fact, that's all they're manufacturing in Brazil today because that's where the demand is. And at potentially lower costs than ever before. You know, they keep talking about the um, only small digit hundreds of dollars more per vehicle, maybe three or four hundred dollars per vehicle. It's a, it's a, corro you know, you have to get the anti-corrosive properties uh, associated with the fuel intake system. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other questions? There are a couple there and one in the back. And do you mind keeping your questions short? Go ahead. Uh, I'm not going to remember yet. You talked about ADM as a global company. Uh, how is this characterization reflected? Besides, of course, using uh, material from around the world to make it globally. Okay. Um, your question, Professor, was a uh, how are we globally? We have uh, processing plants in in Europe, uh, both corn processing, oil seed processing, biodiesel plants, and cocoa processing. Uh, in West Africa, we generate or originate our cocoa beans, which are grown mostly in the Ivory Coast, and process those either in Europe or in the United States. Uh, we have an origination business um, of soybeans in Brazil, and most of those beans actually move to China, where we have 20 plants in China. They process along the coast. Um, 
We have palm plantations and processing in Malaysia and Indonesia. Um, most of that palm oil goes to Europe or sometimes elsewhere, sometimes other parts of Asia. Uh, of course, in the U.S., we have a large corn, wheat milling, um, oil seed business here. Uh, and in, uh, we are moving more towards looking at some joint venture opportunities in, uh, in India as well. In fact, some research on a plant called a Jatropha plant, which is um, uh, able to make biodiesel with a non-food plant and um, able to make biodiesel from that at um, fairly low cost. So that's kind of a little picture of the, the world piece. Hi, my name is Ethan Elkind. I teach environmental law over at the uh, law school. And I just had a question as to uh, what kind of policies you'd like to see at the national or even international level to, uh, to address this issue and to encourage the use of, uh, of renewable fuels. Okay. Um, you know, our, our public policy um, position associated with renewable fuels, ADM has been known in the past to be very influential in, in Washington. And um, certainly one of the things we're doing today is to be uh, very um, above board and vocal about what our uh, beliefs are. We have, we have a registered lobbyist now in Washington, a Washington office. And uh, we believe that rational growth with respect to, I mentioned that term before, and I'll be specific about what that means. We think jumping to our renewable fuel standard that exists today, for example, of 7.5 billion gallons, if you just doubled that overnight and said it's 15 billion gallons, we think that'll attract a lot more um, production than perhaps is ready with the demand. Again, you have to have the demand in place to have the production. But a rational approach to say 15 billion gallons, again, the 10% blend, um, in a stepwise fashion uh, would be reasonable. Also to go to 35 billion gallons, which is President Bush's sort of visionary outlook there. I think again, saying that overnight is probably not a rational growth, but you know, something over time is important. Uh, we think that the, um, um, that the uh, blender's credit, which exists today, it allows blenders a 51 cent credit who use ethanol. Uh, some have argued for a phased credit. It's higher credit when oil prices, crude oil prices, traditional petroleum oil prices are low, and a lower credit when crude oil prices are high is probably administratively a bit of a burden, and we think today's will be worked as fine. But if a phased one comes into play, you know, we probably wouldn't argue with it. It's just more of an administrative cost than anything. Uh, we think the tariff, another example of something where there's uh, a tariff for oil Im or for ethanol imported to the U.S., exists, a 50 cent tariff, we think ultimately that will go away, um, will be phased out over a period of time. So we're not fighting that aspect. We think that's something that ultimately will happen. Um, it exists today to kind of protect the U.S. industry, but over time you can probably see ethanol moving around the world um, from Brazil to Japan, from U.S. to Japan, from Brazil to the U.S., just like other markets do. We'll take two more quick questions. I want to take one from this side and then let's go to the back. Go ahead. Um, a quick question was, how do you, could you talk to us a little bit about the level of energy necessary to produce these various fuels, uh, the comparison to refine uh, the, the natural fuels in uh, fossil fuels for, to produce oil or gas versus the amount of energy that's required to produce the ethanol fuel, and how those two compare to yet another source of energy that we haven't mentioned, which is nuclear energy? Sure. Um, I won't have all the data in front of me, but the Department of Energy has a great website that has all these comparisons with their an analysis. And, um, and, and the reason it's sometimes hard without a lar lot of explanation, and Judy said we have to have short answers here, <laughs> is it depends on a lot of what you're doing with the byproducts. And, and quickly, when you make ethanol the way um, a wet mill, corn grinding wet mill process, you not only make ethanol, but you make um, corn gluten, corn oil, corn feed, you make fructose, you make high fructose corn syrup, you make sorbitol, xanthan gum, astaxanthin, a lot of food ingredients. So again, I mentioned 24 ingredients. So it depends on how you value all the byproducts, what this whole equation turns out to be. Often when uh, people announce ethanol plants here in the U.S. that are not a wet mill plant like ADM has, what's called a dry mill ethanol plant, you only make two products, ethanol and then something called distiller dry grains or dry distiller grains, which are a feed product for animals. Um, again, it depends on you how you value that feed product. So ethanol has a positive energy balance. Um, producing oil and gas and refining it into um, 
um, diesel and gasoline and, and jet fuel um, also has a positive energy balance. But to think about all three of them, or, and you mentioned nuclear, there's wind, there's solar. You know, there is a long list that uh, depends on how renewable and what you're using. Wind is one of the, um, of course, uh, most efficient uses, and solar in certain uh, circumstances is, is extremely efficient. So even a few you haven't mentioned um, are part of it. And of course, the most efficient use is conservation. It's the most available alternative energy uh, around, and that's not using what we're already using today and in ways that uh, certainly our, our society can do a lot more, I think, to pick up the, pick up the pace on. Hi, my name is Stephen Mullenix. I'm an alum and also I work for a private equity fund that we invest in renewable power and uh, biofuels. Oh, Hi. Um, one of the questions I had, ethanol sort of only alcohol. Only one. It, well, the only question. Industrial ethanol has gone sort of a 25-year history in this, in this country, as you've said. Biodiesel seems poised to try to make the same leap in five years. And obviously the cost curve comes down quite a bit over 25, 30 years of innovation. How do you see that happening with biodiesel compared to ethanol? Yeah, um, I see biodiesel on a bit of a slower track myself, and the reason is we, um, uh, we're not as highly, um, we're not a, a, a distillate country the way the European countries are. We don't run a lot of diesel engines in our, in our automotive um, fleets. Uh, we do, of course, have diesel engines in our truck fleets and in our larger um, transportation truck fleets. Uh, it also, biodiesel plants are, are quite small compared to ethanol plants and what you can produce. And so I see a, a regional growth. And uh, by that I mean smaller biodiesel plants close to the source, be they in um, uh, the Midwest with uh, uh, canola or soy. Or even um, one interesting aspect is um, hydro treating biodiesel or hydro treating a, a, um, a biodiesel product, a, a vegetable oil product, excuse me, like palm oil right in the front end of, um, of your, uh, I'm trying not to go back to technical terms, right in the front end of your distillation in a refinery, a basic uh, crude oil refinery, you could also use um, vegetable oil in that process and make a biodiesel or even what's called a green diesel from that. So I see different tracks of the biodiesel slash green diesel, very low sulfur um, uh, opportunity uh, occurring in this country, but on a much slower basis than what ethanol has been today. Thanks for the question. Um, I'm going to take the prerogative again as, as with the last question here, with apologies. Um, just stepping back, and now that the company is changing uh, and certainly morphing into a more energy-based company, even if it isn't just energy-based, and it's renewable energy and much more environmentally aware, is that changing the soul of the company, the values, the kinds of people that get attracted into and stay in the company? Um, I think it's a, a great question, and uh, having been there 10 months, so um, <laughs> to speak to the soul of a company, you know, you need a little bit more time uh, with that. Um, what I can say is that it's an exciting future to think about the opportunity to not just make an extra additional food ingredient, which some of our researchers and our scientists are, um, you know, food geneticists and they're um, chemists and they're biochemists and they're food specialists. And we may work in these tiny little food ingredients for a craft or a General Mills. And those are those are fun types of jobs as well. But this opportunity to kind of lift our heads up and be part of a greater uh, contribution to both food products, feed products, uh, and to fuel the world, I think is exciting in terms of, of recruiting. And an example might be while we have a lot of these types of researchers, we don't have a lot of, we have some, but not a lot of chemical engineers or fuel technology specialists or gasification specialists that maybe they've gone to other companies before and they now see this space as exciting as we do. And I think it actually makes the recruiting effort uh, if not the retention effort, which I haven't quite seen uh, yet, uh, even more exciting. We're opening uh, further research centers, some of them aligned with universities, uh, one near the University of Illinois, which is close to our uh, corporate headquarters. And uh, I think that, again, makes the, the recruiting aspect uh, quite exciting. Well, please join me in thanking Pat for <laughs> educating us. It's noble and token. And we look forward to seeing ADM as the best
company in the world yeah. as it continues to be. Thank, Thank you, you Ben. Thanks.